I'm sorry I couldn't be with you yesterday. I was actually in a meeting in Monaco, of all places. It was a bit warmer there um, on keeping plastics out of the oceans, private sector consultation. It was quite interesting. David asked me originally to talk about green bonds, and then I looked at green bonds and I thought, well, what is the really most important instrument for biodiversity? And it's not, is it bonds, is it equity? It's actually an invoice. One of our problems is what do we have to sell that can bring in money that we can then eventually pay back a bond or provide a, pay a dividend or have a capital appreciation in a company? And so I switched the, the topic around, David, sorry, and I went to um, um, looking at the, the importance of understanding where the cash flow is and then backing into that saying, well, what type of instruments one might be able to use, whether it's green bonds or so on. And so to me, the, the most important challenge we have in biodiversity is how do we get a cash flow out of it? How do we get a payment? And also secondarily, how do we have that be really fungible, flexible? where you could actually move in and move out of, of the asset. One of the problems we have in biodiversity, of course, is a lot of our biodiversity assets aren't in the market. They're nationalized. They're owned by the state. The state owns the coasts. It owns the wildlife. It owns the forests and so on. And so one of the challenges we have in getting private sector finance into biodiversity is that biodiversity itself is not private. It's often owned by the state or in some, some countries and in some property rights structures, it's unowned. It's um, not owned by anybody, and that makes it difficult. So what I thought I'd do in my presentation is talk about two approaches that I'm involved in that are trying to figure out how to get biodiversity more clearly linked to returns off of the land or returns off of um, good biodiversity management. So I guess you could say I'd, the presentation's in the camp of standards for biodiversity responsibility. And today we've got uh, big discussions about accounting for nature, natural capital accounting, and that's one strain, a very, very interesting strain, very exciting strain. And another one, the one that I'm sort of more into is standards, um, standards which would then say, if we manage our business in a certain way, the cash that we're generating out of the business is also cash that's helping to provide a biodiversity outcome or improve biodiversity performance. And so I'll do two. The first one is the International Finance Corporation standard, and the second one is something we're working on called verified conservation areas. The IFC is probably the, the main sort of standard for biodiversity responsible investment. It's a risk mitigation standard. It's, it's basically to minimize the risk to the lenders for investing in a project that might have negative impacts on nature. But in so doing, it actually moves beyond just risk into having a project be a positive force for nature. First of all, it's quite robust in what it covers. It's very specific that a, a private investment, in order to be eligible for a lender that wants to enforce these standards, and there are many that do, um, as I mentioned in the slide there, they've been adopted by the export credit agencies of our developed countries, and they've been adopted by many commercial institutions through an off, um, a program called the Equator Principles. The, the expectations is that this private investment protects and conserves biodiversity, maintains the benefit of ecosystem services, and promotes the sustainable management of living natural resources. So you've got investors, bankers already saying to companies, if you want our money, we want to see you be good for nature. We want to see you um, have at least a no, a no negative impact, but as you'll see, probably a positive impact. And it looks at a number of issues in the standard. This is a really interesting standard. It's only about eight pages long, and it covers all the issues. But probably the most interesting from the viewpoint of financing is the first one, habitats. The focus is really heavily on maintaining the landscape, protecting the landscape, conserving, restoring, looking after the landscape, minimizing your footprint on the landscape, and so on. And that then starts getting into something that is assetable, a, a habitat, hectares, something that you can measure, that you can monitor. The other ones are important, but the habitats one is the big driver of this standard. And the approach then, which many of you know, is, is an approach that says you have to work through a logical sequence of steps of how you relate to that habitat, how you relate to this area in which the business is operating. 
You need to avoid first, and then you need to minimize, then you need to restore, and that's called the mitigation hierarchy. And if you can't do all three of those adequately enough on your site, then you need to go off-site and do an offset to sort of recoup. But at the end of the day, the expectation of an investment under the IFC standard is that it will at least be no net loss and preferably a net gain. So this is a biodiversity positive flow of money. So if a project, whatever that project is, it could be a golf course, it could be a mine, it could be a forest, it could be a farm, if it's complying with IFC PF6, we could call it a biodiversity positive, a biodiversity um, supporting investment. And one could call it then, any sale from that, if you will, instead of a green bond, would be generating a green invoice, an invoice for the sale of goods and services from a project that's actually good for nature. Um, we're tying this into the CBD world just quickly. Offsets were highlighted in, back years ago when, uh, in the financial resource mobilization strategy. It was at COP8, I think, in 2000, and COP9, um, in 2008. And actually looking at the way the IFC standards works, offsets is just one element of the financial capacity of this. The other three, avoid, minimize, and restore, are the key ones because they're really about managing an area in a biodiversity responsible way and putting real resources, funds into that management. Offsets is a part of it, but it's only, it's only the end bit. Okay, two examples quickly um, that I've been involved in. I did the PS6 audit for this project, which was canceled because of the geopolitics of the Crimea. It was a plan to bring um, gas from Russia across into the southern part of Europe. Um, very interesting project. Um, they were completely com uh, working to be compliant with PS6. You had, as you can see by the picture, if you will, three parts of the project for biodiversity, two landfalls, one in Russia and one in Bulgaria, and then the pipeline itself across the Black Sea. The, um, it was really interesting because this was a project owned by half by Russia, by Gazprom, and half by Western European companies. It wasn't a developing country project, but the project nevertheless was fully committed to having an, a positive impact on biodiversity. So that gas, forget the geopolitics of it, if it had gone through, could have been biodiversity positive gas. And I was on the site in both, both the landfalls looking at what they could do. On the Russian side, it was a degraded vineyard. How do we restore that? On the Bulgarian side, it was a, actually a pretty beat up forest, coastal forest, and so on. So that's one example of creating biodiversity outcomes from an investment. Another one that I've been involved with is a coal mine expansion in Mozambique, which has both um, the expansion of the coal uh, f um, mining itself, the railroad and port facilities um, in, in Mozambique and part of the railway going through Malawi. Mm -hmm. Again, this one, now IFC here directly involved, Full compliance with this standard meant that this mining operation is actually a mining operation that can improve the status of biodiversity in that part of the world um, through not only in the construction phase but through the operations of the mine. Okay, going from that as a risk mitigation tool, one of the things we've been working on is to say how do we move the topic from just mitigating risk of biodiversity on biodiversity to looking at this habitat as a type of biodiversity asset. One of the shortcomings as well the IFC approach is it's focused on the lenders, and the lenders, once they get their money back, that governance is over. So say you've got a 30-year project, the lenders are in for 10 years, the lenders get paid back, now what happens to all the PS6 and all the standards? So how do you lock that in? How do you lock in a area-based conservation management program? And this we've been trying to do with something we're calling verified conservation areas as an attempt to create a sort of conservation as an asset class, as an investable asset class. And then the financial flows are the goods and services that can generate invoices out of that asset class. And that might be agricultural products, it might be golfing, it might be um, tourism, it might be timber, it might be carbon, um, it might be red plus, et cetera. So, the, the, let me just go back up, sorry. Um, so the way that this, this system works very, very quickly, you can see it on the website, is that it's looking at um, recognizing areas 
that are being managed for conservation through management, that are being managed for conservation, not just legislated for conservation. So our traditional protected areas tend to be legislated. The government declares this is a protected area, and that's great, and it's a really important part of the biodiversity program. But what about the areas outside of parks that are actually can deliver conservation? So this, this system basically recognizes a management um, plan an annual reporting process and the plan and the process um, having audits. So it's a process approach to saying how do we recognize that a piece of the planet is actually being managed. Okay. For investment points, the first one is I have up there is inside the fence is it tied in very much with the PF6 approach but taking it through the life cycle of the project. So let's just take that first word, avoidance. If a company that's in its site decides to avoid certain critical habitats, one of the challenges we face with the, with the IFC approach is how do we make that avoidance sustainable? So how do we have sustainable avoidance? Um, two weeks ago, I was on another PS6 audit in Guinea, Conakry, in West Africa, um, a bauxite mine with chimpanzees. So really, one fun stuff to deal with. How do you deal with mining and chimpanzees? Um, the company wants to avoid chimpanzee habitat, but the locals want to cut it down and put in farming, slash and burn farming. So how do you get sustainable avoidance? Can a verified conservation area create a management plan for an area that goes through the life cycle and addresses those issues? Of course, it can also be used for outside the fence, supporting offsets, working with local communities, and so on. And for companies that are, have conservation more in their supply chains, if you will, the Unilevers and Nestle's of the world, how do you then link a landscape level conservation standard to the commodity standards that we already have in place? Two examples, and then I'll stop. One example is um, a large scale wilderness restoration project in Mozambique called Cinco Grande. It's one of our first registered VCAs. It's a private concession. Um, in Mozambique, you can get a hunting concession like a forestry concession. So instead of cutting down trees, you shoot animals. The problem he has is there's no animals to shoot because they've all been eaten by the locals. So he has about a $25 million biz, uh, business plan to reintroduce everything from the dung beetle to the elephant to introduce all the wildlife. Um, and this will be on an investment basis, a private investment in which the investors will be able to have ecotourism operations, hunting operations, and so on. Very, very interesting project. It's not exactly your traditional protected area. It's a hunting concession but a, a, with a major restoration program. Now, another one of our first um, registered areas is a, is a gas operation in Yemen, actually where the, um, the typhoon hurricane just hit last week here. And there, the registration is for the, for the harbor, the marine area, not the terrestrial, but the marine area, which has got coral reefs, fish habitat, and so on. And this is a project, the invest, major investor in this project is Tiltal, they're a 38% 30, stakeholder. And they see this using the verified conservation area approach as a way to actually articulate their biodiversity conservation. It has a management plan, it has an auditing process, and to make a long story very short, the, the marine scientists in the field that I've been there with in the field from up through the IUCN marine program say it's the best kept coral reef system in the, in the ocean. And it's, it's a coral reef system protected by a gas company, not by a park. And they then see, Total see this delivering biodiversity conservation with gas as a, a way that they can actually articulate themselves as responsible. Um, suppliers. So if you want to, you could talk about the Yemen gas as green gas or biodiversity responsible gas. Okay, that's it. So two, two tools. The IFC performance standard is a tool for risk mitigation, but actually opens up the whole door to habitats as an asset. The VCA, which is based on the standard, then takes that concept and says, can we lock it into a recognition of verified conservation areas as an investable asset, all wrapped around those assets delivering cash that then pays for the conservation through the sale of goods and services that are produced in a biodiversity responsible way. Thank you, Frank.
Before we proceed, uh, we have a few minutes for clarification questions. Afterwards, we have an hour to, to discuss in more depth and get into the nitty-gritty details of the concepts. But for that, uh, for the moment, are there any clarification questions that anybody would like to ask to Frank? Yes, please. Thank you, Francis Warwick, Master from DeBeer, South Africa. Just a, a question around the, the status of those, uh, those VCAs. If they don't enjoy protected area status, what, what measures are in place to protect from a cumulative impact point of view? I mean, it's all very well that the company manages it. Is, is there a way to, to give more status to those areas, uh, apart from going to full protected area status? The, um, the, the ownership structure or the tenure structure is a really critical issue. It's a critical issue for biodiversity. Um, in the case, for example, the bauxite mine I was at two weeks ago in Guinea, they have a long-term lease for mining. One of the questions that's not there is what happens when the mining's done? Who, what, does it, and what you could conceivably do in that case is you could use the VCA approach for continuing the IFC standards through the life cycle of the project and ideally work with, in this case, work with the government to turn that into a protected area after the mining's over or into a community-based conservation area. So you're 100% right that the question of what type of tenure is on that property, the, the, the con hunting concession in Mozambique under the Mozambique law is a 20-year lease. It's very hard to get a $25 million investment into a property with a 20-year lease. So the manager is trying to turn it into 99-year use leases, which are based on agriculture, but he's saying, I want it to be based around uh, nature conservation. So you, your question of where do you get the tenure and so on is important. But in other parts of the world, in Europe, for example, there is secure tenure. And so Europe has a program called the Wildlife Estates Label, which is a way to recognize conservation on private lands. So other areas, the tenure question is less complicated because you can get security of tenure and, that, that, and tie it in. So it varies. Thank you, Frank. And I'm sorry to, I just wanted to specify, please, uh, especially for the people who are online, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, just I'll take the liberty to introduce the previous speaker. It was Mr. Warwick Mustard from the Bears, because uh, I was at your presentation yesterday. <laughs> but um, thank you. Introduce yourself, please, when, when asking. Thanks. Yeah, good morning. My name is Marina von Weissenberg, and I'm from the Ministry of Environment in, here in Finland. Uh, Frank, you mentioned uh, on the margins about the plastic and oceans. And uh, in fact, I think that's a, a very interesting new approach, which, uh, in my understanding, uh, the collection of the plastic from the ocean also uh, has now involved the private sector. For instance, Adidas is doing this now together with uh, NGOs and, and uh, the banks, and they are trying to, or, or involved in, in using the plastic for recycle new uh, sports uh, clothes and stuff. And I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity to also get the uh, quality of the oceans uh, in, a, in a much uh, better state than, than today because I think the plastic is one of the worst uh, elements we have in the ocean at the moment. So my question to you is, uh, you were in Monaco, uh, what uh, did you discuss there? I mean, uh, how can the private sector be involved in, in this protection of, of the ocean? Because I think that's a, a new opening uh, for, for, for our main aim. Thank you. The, um, uh, the meeting on, on the last two days with the private sector in Monaco was really interesting, but it was, was particularly interesting was the focus was on keeping plastic from getting there in the first place, so land-based solutions. Um, and in fact, we probably shouldn't have had the meeting in Monaco. We should have had it in Paris or someplace inland um, away from the sea because that's where the problem is. The problem is the stuff we're letting go in. So we, we basically concluded with a view of how do you, you stand down at the coast, you turn around and look inwards, and how do you go backwards in the supply chain and find out where the leakages are? 
the leakages in our municipal waste systems, the all the way up to the companies that are using the products. We had Nestle's there, for example, we talked a lot about Nestle's and packaging, um, and then all the way up to the actual plastic manufacturers. Interesting in that compared to the session on finance, the discussion wasn't so much on funding, it was about um, supply chain management and engineering. And the, as the chap from Nestle says, the solutions are simple. We just need to get the right people around the table and just fix, uh, turn off the tap, turn off the plastic tap. Now, from a financing perspective, what we're talking about here, are there drivers to actually put the investments into that? That's a question. But what came out at the end of our little meeting is it's clearly a private-public partnership space dealing with local municipalities and their, sewer, their, their waste manage, you know, solid waste management, dealing with the manufacturers and so on and so forth. But it's 99% really about what do we do before the stuff gets into the sea. Um, and, and if we can even get that discussion going, it would be quite interesting. But the, it was, nobody felt that the constraint was money. The constraint was more about getting the right players in the room and figuring out where the leaks are and then plugging them. Interesting. Thanks, Frank. Can I see a, a final question online before we, we move to the next speaker? How largely are uh, the IFC performance, how, how largely is the IFC performance standard six used? Is it something niche or is it growing? I, I think it's, it's an, a really interesting question. I've been involved now as an auditor on three projects in the last couple of years, and there are all these large-scale uh, projects. The, the, one in, the Russian one was interesting because it wasn't a developing country, but it was using the standard. I would say what we've got is we're, we've got a, a momentum that it's starting to be taken really seriously. Um, I mentioned the IFC standard. The other um, multilateral banks are also have variants of that, their own standards. So the African Development Bank, EIB, um, uh, European Investment Bank, and so on. The, the, to me, one of the big game changers was when our export credit agencies agreed on something called the OECD Common Approaches to use the standard as a way to make its decisions. So, you know, our export credit agencies are quasi-government investment vehicles that are often the first stop in, in the first step in the process. So you go to them and you get a guarantee from them and then you can move on. That only happened in 2012 that they started to take this on board. And so literally my, 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 my work has been on biodiversity conservation in this area is working with government export credit agencies and private banks. So I have a call this afternoon on the, um, the um, bauxite mine story with the IFC and with Sukgen. So it's happening. I think it's starting to happen. It, it, it's not going to do all the small medium enterprise business. It's not going to necessarily do all the investments in developing countries, in developed countries, but it's starting to create a, a framework and a standard that I th we could use to push biodiversity positive outcomes out of investments everywhere. You know, or, or variants of the standard for, for different markets and different legal jurisdictions. Thank you, Frank. And indeed, uh, it's uh, important to have standards when making investments uh, that respond to certain criteria, biodiversity criteria, and environmental criteria, and we'll come back to more during the panel discussion. And now I'd like to invite Anders Nordheim from the UNEP Finance Initiative to provide you with a presentation on how to scale up finance in, in the finance sector.